Our living word this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is to prophecy, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I hear a few of you responding. Good to see you. Uh, we weren't sure how many we were planning this um, outdoor worship, parking lot worship, drive in, whatever we want to call it. How many folks would come? But it's exciting to see. We have a pretty full lot. I think over 30 cars here. So this is exciting to see you all. I know a lot of us uh, we haven't met yet. I'm looking forward to that, but I'm glad to see you out today. And hopefully we'll be back in the building soon. Um, this is just a weird time. None of us have lived in a pandemic like this and we're figuring it out together and we appreciate your patience and your grace through this and it's just good to be here together. Amen? You can honk if you want to that. And uh, you know, I was looking ahead to next week's weather. It's supposed to be in the upper 80s, so I think we made out okay today with what we got, so that worked out well. <laughs> And I also want to uh, just say uh, welcome if you're joining us from home on Facebook today. Glad that you're there and wa welcome today and glad that you're here with us this morning also. And uh, so we started this new series last week that we're calling Therefore and it's based out of Romans chapter 12. And uh, so we're taking the next couple weeks, the rest of June, to take a moment and look at what Paul has to say to us as about what would be a reasonable response to the gospel, to the good news of God saving and redemptive work to us expressed in Jesus. And uh, Paul just outlines that, the first 11 chapters of Romans. That's what it's about. Paul outlines what that looks like, uh, what it means. It's a lot of theology, a lot of good stuff. Hopefully you're reading along with us as we read through this, uh, work through this uh, message in Romans. But if you're here last week, if you joined us from home, you might remember, you might recall that we just looked at verse 1. We spent some time talking about this amazing amazing goodness of God's mercy, of his compassion that's expressed to us in Jesus. And uh, we said at the end of this that Paul says our reasonable response to that is for us to offer our lives to him. To say this is what the Christian life is all about. Really, it's about surrender. When you boil it down, you get down to it, it's about surrender. It's about saying, I'm going to let go of those things I'm going to hold tightly to, that I'm really gripping and holding on to things that I want to still keep control of, I want to keep for my own, and giving those over, releasing those, and giving that over to God, and letting Him have control, and learning to trust Him with our lives and all parts of it. And uh, 
If you read different translations, there's one out there called The Message by Eugene Peterson. It was a way that he put the words into the people's language that he was pastoring to. So he wrote these as a pastor. He never set out to actually do a translation of the Bible. He was just trying to put it into the language of his congregation. But this is what he writes in Romans 12.1. This is how he translates that. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping. You're eating. You're going to work. Walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. He says, that's your reasonable response. You take your everyday life. You're eating, you're sleeping, you're walking around, you're going to work, you're going to school. That life, you place it before God as an offering and you embrace what God has for you. That's the best thing that you can do for him. Embracing what he has for you. And so this week, as we move forward um, into Romans chapter 12, I want to look at verse 2. And Andrea just read that for us, but this is what we read. We read, do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. So let me pray, and then uh, we'll kind of <clears throat> get into more into the message uh, here this morning. Let me pray. <clears throat> God, we do thank you for what is more than a beautiful day, more than what we've prayed for, more than what we've hoped for. And God, you gave us this gift of a new morning, a gift where we can walk in fullness in your life, a day that we get to experience all that you have for us. So I pray now that as we're gathered here today as a community of believers, that you would just meet us here with your Holy Spirit, that you would speak into our lives, that you would open up your word that it would speak to us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would move through this parking lot. Just as, it reminds me of the, of, the, of the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came as a mighty rushing wind. We've got the mighty rushing wind this morning, but I pray your spirit would move in that way in our hearts today. So come Holy Spirit, speak to us here today. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. And as people said, amen. 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 Well, I'm going to start just this morning by jumping ahead in verse 2 and looking at the end of the verse, which is the, the end that says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, his per perfect will. And I was reading that, I thought, wow, can you imagine that there is something we can do that God has said that will allow us to test and approve? And the idea here is to, to fully and completely experience, it's this experiential knowing, to know how good and pleasing and perfect God's will is for us and as Eugene Peterson wrote about that I just read uh, he described it that's in our everyday ordinary sleeping eating going to work uh, walking around life we can know what God desires for us what God really wants for us and I just want to say this though, as you think about that you know when you find God's will and living into God's will that doesn't mean that doesn't promise us an easy life amen you might know that if you've lived at all as a Christian it doesn't mean our life's going to be easy it doesn't mean it's going to be free from hardships and trials and and death and all those things that come with life it doesn't mean that but I am confident of this as you read that that the creator of the universe the author of everything we see and the things we don't even see that he understands who you are that he sees your heart. He knows the pain that you might be carrying right now. He understands your deepest longings. He's aware of your deepest, darkest sin, the thing that you don't want anyone else to know because you're afraid that what they might think of you. He sees you as no one else sees you, and he knows what causes you fear. He knows what brings you joy. He knows what brings that fullness to your life. And he longs to be a part of your life and to pour out his good, his acceptable, and his perfect desire for you into the deepest and in, in all aspects of your life. That's what God desires. He loves you. He wants to be a part of your life so that he can express that love to you more fully. That's his deepest longing. Again, uh, Eugene Peterson summarizing this in the everyday words for us. He says, 
readily recognize what he, what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Because unlike the culture around you that's always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and he develops a well-formed maturity in you. Now, I don't know about you, have you ever thought about God's will in that way? That he desires more than anything to develop a well-formed maturity within you? Kind of puts a different perspective on God's will for us, doesn't it? Um, think about that maturity what that means and there's a the thing about maturity right if you have kids you know this it doesn't happen overnight does it oh we pray that it would especially as they're teenagers any teen parents of teenagers you know what and andrea's laughing because she knows you're just praying that they get mature in their life it's as well for maturity that god's doing it's a long process it doesn't happen immediately it takes time uh, Eugene Peterson likes to say it's a long obedience in the same direction. That's what the Christian faith is. It's just a long obedience in the same direction. Not enough if you're like me, uh, but for a long time in my life, I struggled with this. Um, like it was a puzzle. Maybe it, like it was a riddle that I had to solve. Just trying to find out, what is God's will for my life? What is his will for my life? It's almost like God was dangling out in front of me and I just couldn't quite grasp it, right? Or maybe it was hidden somewhere and I was trying to figure it out. But then eventually I came to realize that his ultimate will for me is not some thing I have to figure out, but his ultimate will for me is to live easily, easy in a relationship with him in whatever I do. I like to think about it like this. Imagine if you have kids and your will for them is to have fun. And so you tell them, to go in your backyard and play. There's a swing set out there, there's room to run around, there's all kinds of stuff for them to do. As long as they stay in your yard, they're within your will, right? That's all you ask them to do, go have fun. Now, if they leave your yard, that's a different thing. But as they're in your yard, you don't care if they're swinging, if they're running, uh, kicking a ball around. As long as they're there having fun, they're within your will. Think about God's will like that. As long as we're living within those boundaries that he's given us in his word, we're living within his will. He wants us to enjoy and to have fun and experience that. And so as long as we're within that parameter he gave us in his word, part of it is here, do not conform to the world. We are in God's will and enjoying that. I hope that makes sense, what God's will is. You see, it's not some mystery that we have to solve, that God leaves us to solve, but it's a life to be lived and experienced in ways beyond what you and I imagine even. It's about freedom and joy and peace. It's a life that's full of hope and purpose. But it happens as we surrender our lives to him. Here's one thing about the Christian life. It's not about trying harder, but it's about surrendering more. Not about trying harder to get it right, but it's about surrendering more and giving more of yourself to God. And as we surrender and allow God access to all those parts of our life, it's the Holy Spirit that does a work in us. He brings about a renewal. He brings about a remaking, a new life. He restores and refreshes our life. It's about a new way of discovering and experiencing life. That's what Paul's writing about here when he says, it's about renewing your mind, it's experience a newness. And we can't manufacture that on our own, right? We've tried. It's not by our own efforts, it's something that God's Spirit does in us. And as God works this renewal within us, He equips us for a way of life that's different, that's distinct from the culture around us and what it's offering us. So Paul says, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind because Paul knows this. I believe Paul knows this. He knows that the great enemy to renewal and enjoying God's will for us is conformity to this world. So Paul pleads. He says, do not conform. He says, we need to live differently. It's a call to live in a different way out to the uniqueness that God has crafted in us, within each of us. It's a call to for us to discover the fullness of his grace not to fall into a lifestyle based on the patterns of the world. You might call that a worldly 
Christian. That's not what we want. But you know, it's easy to be conformed, isn't it? We're bombarded every day by this persistent advertising and things telling us, offering us ways to make our life better, to give us an answer to happiness. So if you just buy this, you'll be happy. If you just go on this vacation, you'll be happy. If you just get on this diet, you'll be more happy. All these things come at us every day, don't they? Ways that we can make our lives better. We face it everywhere we turn. Just as an example, I want to do a little exercise today just to see how subtly, maybe not so subtly, we are influenced uh, by these things around us. So we're going to play this little game. Um, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to say a slogan uh, from a company and you just have to acknowledge, if you're with someone, you can tell them in their, your car what this company is or what it, what it relates to. Sound good? Honk if you're game. That's, that's pretty good. That's like half of you. That's good. The other half might still be enjoying your coffee. That's okay. But I just want to see just, just how easily we're influenced by advertising. So if you're ready, here's the first one. Uh, just do it. Do you know who that is? I heard someone. Nike. That's right. That's from Nike. Here's the second one. The best part of waking up. Folgers in your cup. Now, I'm not a big Folgers fan, but that's okay. We know the ad. Here's a, here's a third one. I'm loving it. McDonald's. McDonald's. That's right. That's a McDonald's ad. Here's the next. Save money and live better. Anybody know that? You shop there pretty frequently. That's Walmart. That's Walmart's slogan. You save money and you live better. So if you didn't know that, when you go to Walmart, you're going to live better when you're done. You're going you're to save a lot of money, apparently. And then the last one. You're in good hands. All state. Right? So that was just five examples. But can you see how easily these slogans come to influence us? They become a part of who we are. We know as soon as someone says, just do it. We said, oh, that's Nike. And we picture their little swoosh uh, in our mind. And one, what's one thing you notice about all these different slogans as well? They have something to do with a better way of living, don't they? They're saying, Nike's saying, just do it. If you buy our product, you'll be better whatever you do athletically. Folgers say, hey, when you wake up in the morning, the best thing for you is to drink a cup of Folgers. That's the best thing for your life. Walmart says, come shop here. You'll save money and you will live better if you do this. Allstate says, come to us. You're in good hands when you come to us. We'll take care of you. And my point is this. We face these kinds of things every single day. We're bombarded by these. We're constantly needing to sort out what we're hearing from our world from what we hear from God and what God is saying to us. Which message do we listen to? Which message do we listen to? And the reality is, we find ourselves torn between these two worldviews, don't we? Two narratives on what to pursue in life. What will satisfy our deepest needs? One worldview is defined by our faith in Jesus. It's defined by our desire to follow Him. And that life that flows from that, it's the Christian worldview, you might call it, it's kind of how we see, how we understand the world around us. And the other worldview is defined by what our culture is telling us that we need. What our culture is telling us is best for us. And so we find ourselves in a struggle. Trying to balance a lifestyle in the world. That's where we live, right? That's where we work it out in the world. We can't live apart from the world. We can't just run off like a group of monks, can we? And cloister ourselves together, kind of just be separate. We can't do that. But how do we live in a culture that's telling us what we need and what is best for us, while at the same time trying to live out what we understand God is calling us to do? Balancing that lifestyle in a world, honoring Christ, reflecting His nature within us with the message that we're receiving everywhere else. The mistake we make, I think the mistake we make is this, that we try to incorporate 
both worldviews into our lives and make that work. That we kind of straddle the fence between the two. We, get, we keep a foot in both worlds, trying to get the best out of both. So we attempt to lay our Christian faith over our culturally influenced, our culturally shaped lifestyle. But I think if we're really honest with ourselves, if we're really honest deep down, we know that doesn't work. We know it doesn't work well. And we're encountered with a conflict within ourselves of living these two different lifestyles. It creates this dichotomy within us. There's an incongruence within us and we know something's not right. We just can't put our finger on it. And the problem is, the issue is that Paul says, is that if we live that way, it leaves us immature in our faith. It leaves us immature in our faith. We don't reach full maturity. So Paul commands us. He says, don't conform to the patterns of the world. He's appealing to us. He says, enter into this process. Allow God to come in to renew your minds, transform you. Think about the things of God. Sharpen your sense to God's presence. Sharpen your sense to God's leading. You see, it's a call to enter into a spiritual process that will equip us to embrace a style of living that is the best soil for allowing God's Spirit to cultivate lasting transformation within us. You know, it kind of goes to the parable Jesus told about the seed in the sower. Some of the seed, he said, fell on thorny ground. And as the seed came up, it was choked out by the weeds. And Jesus said, those weeds are the worries of the world. It's the things of the world around us that kind of overcome us. And it keeps God's word from coming to fullness within us. Jesus said, that's a problem. That's, that's not the great soil for his uh, word to grow in us, to become fruitful. And I don't think we desire, I don't think we set out to desire to conform to the patterns of the world. I don't think that's our desire. But some of those influences around us, they run so deep within us that we're not even aware of it. We're not even aware that it's happening. But I love what Dallas Willard says. I'll quote him a lot. Willard says this. He says, you must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. He says, you have to arrange your life. You have to do certain things you have to put certain practices into place so that you begin to experience contentment and joy and confidence in your life with god you see he says we bear some burden of responsibility for how we live god does the work in us but we have to put our life in a place where god can do that work that's why we read scripture that's why we pray that's why we invite you to join us for prayer on wednesdays amen it's those kind of practices that help us to put ourselves in a place where God can do the work in us. Because the things we choose to arrange our lives around makes a difference in who we become and how we mature. The New Living Translation uh, maybe conveys this really well, this passage from Romans 12 too. It translates it like this. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you. It'll just be natural. It'll be good, it'll be pleasing, and it will be perfect. You see, God's desire for us is to develop a well-formed maturity. And that maturity doesn't come from following behaviors and customs of the world, but it comes from giving God your heart by allowing God to renew you. Kind of close with this last scripture. This is out of 1 John chapter 2. This is what John writes. <clears throat> Excuse me. John writes this. He says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. 
but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Again, Paul says this. He says the great enemy to spiritual renewal and transformation, maturity in our faith, experiencing God's will for us, is conformity to this world. So let me ask you this morning, this last question. Where do you most struggle with worldliness in your life? Conformity to the world. Where is that for you? I know we all struggle with it at some level, if we're being honest. And then this, how is God calling you to respond to this? In what way is God calling you to respond and give more of yourself to him and begin to live differently, to not conform to the world in this way? Because I want to say, learning to love and to trust God, not the world, being transformed by the renewing of our minds, is the means to discovering the better way that God has for us, God's will that's available and it's a living, um, it's a living and a joyful way to live. It's available to everyone right now. Amen? Amen. 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 Let me pray. So gracious and loving God, just want to thank you for your mercy and your compassion that you express to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that our desire that your desire for us is that we would grow to maturity in our faith so that we can come to fully and completely experience your will, the will that you have for us. So Holy Spirit, show me today where I'm yet immature. Expose my worldliness to me. I do not want to conform to the patterns of this world, yet some of those, I confess, run so deep within me that I don't even have an idea of it yet. I'm not even aware of it yet. So I need you, God, to show that to me. Search me, Holy Spirit. Search me and show me those places where you're calling me to grow. Work those ways out of me and lead me, I pray, in the way of Jesus for his sake. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.